Hello everyone, we are heartened to have the Hip and Happening Group as our series partner for the Giving Conversations. Using promo code GCSGN, proceeds from the first 100 nights booked at the Rucksack Caratel Malacca from now till 31st January 2018 will be channeled to SG Narratives to help us fund the work we do to keep the wonderful and thought-provoking conversations going. In the spirit of giving back, SG Narratives will be donating a portion of the proceeds to all the five organisations involved in the Giving Conversation series. Further information can be found in the description. On to our show. Okay, so my name is Mohamed Nasu Bin Rahmat. So I'm a NTU graduate uh, majoring in Mechanical Engineering. I graduated last year. Yep. So ever since I've been doing the Project Nomad full-time. So my name is Hazik. Um, I'm actually a student in NTU uh, doing Sociology. Um, and currently I'm also one of the co-founders for Nomad. So prior to Nomad, um, I have actually worked a little bit within the social impact space. Um, so, yeah. Ready? 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 Yes. I can't cut you down. Entah? Yeah. I can't cut you down. Ready? Here we go. Why do you think the Project Nomad began as a social entrepreneurship initiative? Um, the thing is that when we started off Nomad, it or we had that in mind, that's the very nature of what we do because it started off with backpacking around India. So as we backpack around India, the strong connection that we sort of like develop with the villagers there uh, propelled us to actually start the Project Nomad because a lot of them uh, have been living in poverty over an extended period of time. And at the same time, because of the cultural practices uh, that they have in creating those crafts, we felt that that's an opportunity for us that we are able to tap on those in order to make a greater um, sense of like livelihood, a greater income for them. Um, and at the same time, we also felt a deep connection to the students there. So when the first time when we were actually in the village, we realized that the children, the first thing that they actually asked from us was not money, but it was pencil instead. So with that in mind, we had the vision to start Nomad as a social enterprise, not simply to make profit, but to ensure that there's an equitable income whereby we empower the artisans and the children that is within that community itself. What personal life experience made you want to help others? Personal life experience, uh, I will say there is two personal life experience uh, that make me want to help others and it also make me want to start the Project Nomad. So the first one is when um, I was actually uh, hiking uh, the Hilmarias for 9 days. So when I was hiking in the Hilmarias for 9 days, you know, I, I didn't have my phone on me. Uh, I was inspired from Into the Wild, sadly. <laughs> so I, I just went to the Hilmarias for the first time uh, alone. So I had a compass um, and I had a map, so I don't have any cell phone with me. So about one hour plus into the track, um, I actually got lost and I had to cross my way uh, to the other side of the bank of the river. So as I was crossing my way, I actually got washed. Um, the river was pretty white. So I actually got washed and I actually like, I was really panicking because there was no one around me. So uh, what happened was like my backpack was strapped to my body. So I had to push myself out, but the current was too strong. So I was at the center of the river bed. The current was too strong and my, I was literally like doing a split. So um, I got pulled back and then I literally gave up because I couldn't fight against the current. So the first thing that I did was I closed my eyes and I, I just gave up. I was like, okay, like this is my time to go. Uh, and strangely, it sounds uh, a little bit corny, but um, the thing that sort of like flash uh, in my mind, uh, something like when I was a kid, my family, um, all those images start flashing around my mind really, really, really fast. So strangely, like, even though I got washed down the stream, right, I realized that why am I still not dead? So <laughs> I kind of realized that I got washed over to the other side of the bank uh, and I managed to get myself out with my hiking stick. So when I was on the other side of the bank, the first thing that came to my mind after that whole experience was if I had gone that day, um, what impact or what have I done? What kind of legacy have I left uh, in, in this world? So for me, it's similar to whatever experience that you have. So because we actually tracked the mountains in Humiliary as well, it's in Sikkim, so it was a nine day track. So we were up at about 3,000 plus meter 3, or so. 3,500, yeah. 3, meter, yeah. So it, it, okay, basically it was during the monsoon season. So we are not supposed to be climbing that mountain. Like all the villagers were telling us like, oh, you guys are pagal, pagal. Pagal means like you guys are crazy. Because yeah. even when we were going 
to the starting point of the mountain, we met with landslides and etc. So it was quite a hassle to actually get there in the first place. Mm -hmm. So like within a day, we actually trekked for around eight hours. And by the time when we reached 3005, that's when I start to have difficulty in breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm supposed to like stop and go down, but instead I keep on pushing. I tell myself, okay, like let's do it. Like this is an opportunity for me to just like see what I want to see uh, and experience what I want to experience. Mm -hmm. Like see the afterlife. <laughs> so like at that moment, I didn't even realize that I was walking until I hit onto something. That's why I'm like, eh, hey, I'm still walking until to the point where I keep on moving towards the edge. And luckily the guide was there to actually grab hold of me. If not, I would have just fall off from the mountain and maybe my body won't be found. <laughs> so after that, the guide actually dragged me all the way to the next pit stop. And that's when I start to hyperventilate. And that's when like, I don't really know what happened. <laughs> Again, what I remember was uh, flashbacks of my mom, my family. And it's always the same thing. Like, what have I done actually? Uh, if I were to be really gone, like I've never really done anything much in my life. Basically, I just follow the norms. And that's the reason why like we are pushing for this, the Project Nomad. Yeah. So how would you describe your work in the Project Nomad to people who has not heard about you? Mm. Mind blowing. <laughs> How would I describe? Uh, okay, usually the way I describe the company is to actually tell them the story behind it so that they have a feel of what the company is all about. Because we don't, have, don't want them to have a misconception that, oh, we are doing like a charitable organization. Organization, Because for us, it's still for profit. But what we would like to do is to make sure that what we do will actually help all these rural people in return. Because there are so many companies out there that has been doing this but they actually partner with those that is already started. So uh, like all these rural peoples, they are being neglected. So that is something that we are trying to tackle uh, as a company. What is the biggest misconception that people have about the work you do in the Project Nomad? The biggest misconception that people have, let me see. So I guess like people thought that the artisans that we actually work with, um, they are kind of like unclear like whether these artisans are we employing them or are we partnering with them so usually that's the first question that people actually kind of like have a misconception uh they are more worried about whether their work environment uh whether you know we are kind of like abusing them or we make sure that you know there's safe work environment and they actually get like an equitable equitable share of income so um the answer to that is that depending on the various community that we work with so for example uh, the artisans that we work with in india is actually a partnership so when we work with them, we do not micromanage telling them that, okay, you know what, uh, we're going to employ you and you're only going to get this X amount of money per month. So instead, um, it's more of a fair trade. So we let them know, um, let's say they, they make this product and how much they actually want to sell those product for because we ultimately believe that it should be ground up. Those people themselves, they will know what they need and how much income they will actually require to sustain their livelihood. And there are also some communities whereby they actually seek to get a more stable income. Uh, for example, currently we're actually working with artisans in Indonesia uh, and for those artisans, we listen to what their needs are. So for them, they're looking for stability. Uh, instead of wanting a partnership, they actually want to be employed uh, by us. So depending on the different community, we work on different models as well. What are you most particularly proud of in your work at the Project Nomad? One of it will be the moment that we actually managed to build for them uh, sanitation facilities in the school because uh, they have been running the school for four years and all the while the children have to actually do their business behind the school in the open. So we realized that it's actually unsafe, especially for the girls there and we all know the rape cases and etc. So to be able to actually build for them, to be with them to build even, is something I'm very, very proud of up mm -hmm. till today. And it's something that I will always share to everyone who asks like, what have you done uh, for the kids uh, in the village? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any like circumstances where you feel proud uh, because of like an in individual particularly that you impact, like be it in Indonesia or in, in India when it comes to employing the artisans? 
One of it will be in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. So the artisan, before he even joined us, he was telling me like how he haven't even started working. So the last time he worked was before he actually got married. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how the artisans, how Indonesians in the place that we actually work is that they will actually go out of their country mm-hmm. in order to work, in order to have enough income before they start to get married. So like before he, after he get married, that's when like he always do odd jobs and he realized that it's not something that he can actually support his family in the long run. So when we started to converse with him, that's when he actually opened up and tell about his struggles. And when I tell him that, oh, I would like to employ you, he was really, really very happy. Mm-hmm. And since then, it has been going very smoothly with him. Mm-hmm. Where do you see the oh. Project Nomad in 10 years? Where do I see Project Nomad in 10 years? Um, well, first and foremost, like uh, we're actually gonna pivot the company a little bit it's like something that is quite exciting we're not gonna reveal like the full details of what it's gonna be about right now um but we're trying to make it into a collective whereby we actually have different artisanal communities um within uh the work that we do so instead of like just working with one community we're gonna have a collective like different artisanal communities um doing different cool things for example like apparels to bag um, and it's a place where, you know, in, in, in times where everything is all about fast fashion, you can get products that is like, you know, made, uh, made by hand, made by artisans that actually have a meaning and story behind those products. And I think those products um, actually have value for people who actually appreciate um, this kind of like, um, kind of like artsy, fatsy product. And at the same time, I understand the, the, the soul that people put in to create, creating those products. So that's kind of like the direction that we are going towards in the future. Um, and definitely within 10 years time, we foresee ourselves to not just be in Singapore, uh, we're gonna go bigger, um, we had in mind of going to States. Yeah, definitely within 10 years time is something that we should be able to reach. Yeah. What do you think about your overall experience shooting with SG Uh, I think it's a very interesting experience. <laughs> uh, unique in some sense that usually the questions that we got, uh, um, because when, when, when you guys start asking questions, right, I was like, oh, okay, this is normal questions, normal questions, like, whoa, okay, <laughs> it, uh, this is something different. Um, so yeah, like, I think it's quite nice. What do you think about the questions asked? Really? Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> something that we never really expect. <laughs> but all in all, like, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, but what, uh, we hope that the questions, as in the questions asked more or less, uh, it's quite holistic, so I hope that we are able to convey whatever messages that we need to tell to our audiences. Yeah. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you once again to our series partner, The Hip and Happening Group, for believing in the work that we do. Do remember to follow us on Facebook to be instantly notified when our new video is up. In the meantime, be your own willing, stand by your stories, and we, We'll be with you too.